Uh, so welcome everyone to today's meeting of the Western Hemisphere Virtual Symbiotic Seminar. We're very happy to have Sarah Blackwell here from the University of Georgia, who's going to tell us about triple knot grid diagrams. Cool. Well, um, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I guess a few organizational notes. So I, I think I can see I can see the chat up here. If, but if I do, if I miss take a question in the chat, just um, shout out. Um, also, I've given this talk a few times and I tend to speed through it. So I'm very, I'd be very happy if people slow me down with questions or whatever, um, but I will try, hey, Sarah, try not. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to monitor the chat for questions. Okay, great. Um, okay, so let's get to it. Um, all right, go right into a definition. What is this thing? So a triple knot grid diagram, I will abbreviate TKGD is a diagram on a torus made up of vertical, horizontal, and diagonal grid lines like so. Um, and I want, I want an equal number of vertical, horizontal, and diagonal grid lines um, with dots placed inside such that each row, column, and diagonal has exactly two or zero dots. Um, if you're familiar with just regular knot grid, oh wait, nope, sorry, don't want to get there yet. Sorry, one more comment before that. Um, so one thing that's particular, um, to keep in mind is that this is on a torus. And so this diagram might um, at first look like there aren't, looks like it doesn't satisfy the, the two or zero dots in the diagonals. But here I kind of color coded the diagonals um, so that you can kind of see what wraps around. So this light green diagonal that we go off over here on the left and come back in and that's the same as this diagonal here. Um, and then the kind of medium green um, wraps over here and then this like darker green here. Um, so, so really there's only just like there's only three vertical and horizontal or three rows and three columns there, there are really only three diagonals here. Um, and then I also put a little note, um, use lower triangles. Um, so if you look at every pink and blue box here, there's, it's kind of made up into two triangles by, by the green. And I've kind of made a convention that I'm only going to put dots in, in these like lower looking triangles. Um, and this is just like a choice that I made based on like the overall structure of where this is coming from um, that I don't want to get into, but it doesn't really matter so much. Um, uh, this choice doesn't matter so much. It just makes the diagrams look nicer. <laughs> um, okay, so now on to what I was going to say. So if you are familiar with just regular knot diagrams that don't have the diagonals, um, and if you aren't, it's okay. I, I will talk about this in a bit. If you are, um, this zero condition might might puzzle you because for regular um, grid diagrams, uh, it's you just want to only have two dots in each row and column. And the reason is because if you have empty rows and columns, um, oh, and I sorry, there is a chat. Oh, link to my amazing slides. Nice. Okay. Um, uh, so if you have empty rows and columns in like a regular diagram, you kind of just get rid of them, and it doesn't change the knot type. Um, of, of the knot that you're getting from your diagram. Um, so here I want to kind of show you an example of why why I'm putting zero in my definition. Um, click. Um, uh, so here um, is a six by six grid that has two empty rows, columns, and diagonals. And um, when you have triple knot grid diagrams, you can't just like take away rows and columns. So I can't just get rid of this these columns and these rows here. Um, because it shifts the diagonals, and so now it will it would totally mess up um, the diagonal condition. Um, so so adding this these diagonals in um, makes these diagrams kind of like a lot more rigid. And then on the flip side, it's not easy to like. So you can kind of like stay there's you can stabilize and destabilize. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, regular not grid diagrams, um, but for these, it's kind of like much harder to to work with these. And like if you have if you have a triple knot grid diagram. You can't just add. You can't just add blank um, rows and columns willy nilly and get like a larger one. Um, so these things are already kind of um, like finicky. Um, and then just one one definition before we go on. Um, so the grid number for a triple knot grid diagram is n if the grid is n by n. Okay. Uh, so that's a definition. Uh, you're probably wondering how I got here. So it's all. It's all well and good to define um, that thing, but like, where does it come from? Um, what's what's the context for why I care about this? Um, besides caring about it for the sake of caring about it, which you know, 
won't go into philosophy there. Okay. Um, but the background, the context which this is, this whole project is sitting in, um, is is trisections of four manifolds, and the, and this is um, where all of the where this comes from. So, um, a trisection is something is a decomposition of a four manifold, and it's it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You decom you can you decompose your four manifold into three pieces. Um, this is something that was um, defined by my advisor Dave Gay and then Rob Kirby my grand advisor, I guess. Um, so a GK trisection of a smooth, closed, connected, oriented four manifold X um, is a decomposition into three pieces, X1, X2, and X3. And I guess I should, before I keep going with the definition, I should say that some of these conditions, um, uh, you can define trisections for, for instance, um, manifold, four manifolds with boundary and non-oriental four manifolds that has been done recently, but um, won't. I won't get into that because uh, I won't need that. Um, but okay, so it's a decomposition um, into three pieces such that, so my three pieces XI, um, these are my four dimensional pieces. Um, these are going to be boundary connect sums of K copies of S1 cross P3. Um, and these are, these are particularly nice four dimensional pieces. These are four dimensional one handle bodies. Um, and then even, Further, I want the intersection of two of these pieces. So the intersection of these two four dimensional pieces should be a three dimensional piece. Um, this is going to be a genus G handle body. And then I want the triple intersection of my four, of my three four dimensional pieces to be a genus G surface. And so over here is kind of like a schematic, um, like a Mercedes Benz diagram, I think is what my advisor called it. Um, of what's going on. Here's my four manifold. Here's my three dimensional piece, sorry, my three four dimensional pieces. Um, and then these, these colored lines are my handle bodies. And then this dot in the middle is my surface where they all intersect. Um, and so a few things to note about trisections. Um, kind of the, the reason trisections are great is because we have this, this existence and uniqueness um, results. So what do I mean by this very loosely? Um, uh, every four manifold, well, with, with these adjectives, admits a trisection, um, and then they are unique up to like this stabilization operation. So they're unique up to, you know, the sum reasonable definition of uniqueness. Um, and the other cool thing about trisection, well, there are lots of cool things, but another cool thing about trisection is that it's determined by the spine. Um, and the spine is what we call the, the two and three dimensional pieces. So in this picture over here, it's this um, like Y here. Um, and that's that's due to a theorem of Lannenbach and Poinaru. Um, once once you have these these um, three dimensional pieces that satisfy the, these requirements here, you can uniquely fill in with a, a four dimensional one handle body. Um, so that's cool, and that will allow us to draw diagrams, which I will get to in a second. But I think I have something else first. Um, yeah, so maybe I should have led with this, but. Um, uh, if you haven't seen trisections before, kind of the moral of the story is that it's it's a four dimensional analog of what's going on with Higgard splitting. So um, Higgard splitting is a decomposition of a three manifold into two pieces. And I see a chat who proved the spine results. Um, well, I guess I guess it's attributed to Laudenbach and Poinaru because um, uh, let me go back. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah. So, so trisections did you know didn't exist until by advisor and Kirby, you know, came up with them. Um, but it's due to a lot of Bakken point of view that we can uniquely fill in um, uh, these four dimensional pieces. So, yeah, I would I would say that would be attributed to them. Um, okay. Um, cool. So yeah. So this is a four dimensional analog of Higgard splittings, and then like uh, even more. So there are Higgard splittings like hidden, not hidden, but there, there are Hig Higgard splittings going on in this uh, situation here. Um, so in particular, the boundary of each four dimensional piece is, is a Higgard splitting. So let's, if we look over here at like X1, um, the boundary of X1 is this pink handle body here and this blue handle body here. Um, and if we think about what actually, what this manifold is, the, the boundary of X1 is a boundary of a boundary connect sum of k copies of S1 cross P3, which is a connect sum of k copies of S1 cross S2. Um, and so this, um, this boundary here is a Higgard splitting for a connect sum of k copies of S1 cross S2. 
Um, and I'm, I'm bringing this up because in the next slide, I'm gonna show you how to make diagrams for these things. And that's going to be important to keep in mind. Okay, um, so because, um, because everything is determined by these two and three dimensional pieces, we can do um, we can we can describe um, trisections with trisection diagrams, which are kind of like um, Higger diagrams with three sets of curves instead of two, kind of. So a GK trisection diagram. Oh, and I should have emphasized. Let me go back really quick. I uh, just just to reemphasize. So um, a trisection has two numbers associated to it: a G and a K. Um, a G G is called the genus. It's the genus of the handle bodies in this um, central surface, and then K is um, the number of components of connect, of connect sums of sorry boundary connect sums of your four dimensional pieces. Um, okay, just to emphasize that. All right, so a trisection diagram is this like quadruple um, of of uh, your central surface, so a genus G surface, and then three sets of curves. Um, I'll call alpha, beta, and gamma, such that if you look pairwise at your sets of curves. Um, so just the surface with alpha beta and then with beta gamma and gamma alpha. Um, these are supposed to be equivalent to the standard Higger diagram for a connect sum of k copies of S1 cross S2. And I've drawn, here is this standard Higger diagram. So um, what, what it is, is we first have k copies um, that look like this, two parallel lines here, or two parallel curves, I guess. And in each one of these is giving me a copy of S1 cross S2. Uh, but then we need this to be a genus B surface. Uh, so if if G is larger than K, then we just tack on a, a bunch of these components and each of these is, is just an S3. So it's not changing manifold, but it's just um, pumping up my genus to be what I want it to be. Um, and and by equivalent here, I should say this this means like slide diffeomorphic. So it might they might not pairwise look exactly like this, but um, there but you could do slide handle slides and, and get it to look like this. Okay, so I'm um, only going to give you one example, but it's also the only example we'll need in this talk. <laughs> um, so here's here's my one example. Um, this I claim, and I will kind of somewhat prove to you in a bit, um, that this is a trisection diagram for CP2. Um, it's genus one. Um, and in this case, the if you look pairwise, um, pairwise, these should be um, Higgard splittings for S3. Um, and one thing I want, I'll say now to preempt a question I will get at the end. So for the whole rest of the talk, I'm going to be working specifically in CP2. And a question that I will get at the end, if I don't say something right now, is uh, can, can, you, can you extend this setup to work in other four manifolds? And the answer is um, maybe not, or it's not so obvious how to do so. Um, and the reason is there's two really special things about CB2 um, that are kind of the reason why I'm focusing on CB2 for this project. So one is that it admits a symplectic structure, that's a symplectic manifold. Um, and the other is that it admits a genus one trisection. And, and that's actually a pretty special thing. So just to kind of um, give you some background, like where the state of the art is um, for for kind of knowing what, what, tri, uh, what trisections admit what genus, Sorry, what am I saying? What form manifolds admit what genus trisection um, is, is the following. So uh, for genus zero, there's only one four manifold that admits a genus zero trisection, that's S4. For genus one, um, there are four, uh, which is S4, S1 cross S3, CP2, and CP2 bar. Um, and then for genus two, um, this is uh, proven by Jeff Meyer, who I think is here, and Alex Zupan. Um, you can do boundary or you can do connect sums of the previous ones and then also S2 cross S2. Um, and that's it for genus two. And then for genus three, um, and this is also due to Jeff Meyer, we have at least, <laughs> we have in, infinitely many um, manifolds <laughs> that emit genus three trisections. Um, and also we haven't, to we haven't finished classifying them. So <laughs> there's like a big jump when we get to genus three and that's kind of still open totally. Um, and so the point, the point that I want to trying to drive home is that having a genus one trisection is very special. Um, and and that's that's the reason that I'm working in CP2 specifically. Sarah, um, can I ask a question? Oh yeah. um, I'm wondering if if I give you a four manifold presented in some convenient form and some G and K, can you tell me if it admits a GK trisection? 
Um, I think you would want to, let's see. I guess it depends like what kind of convenient form. So like, say if you have like a curvy diagram, there are ways of like changing that into a trisection diagram, although maybe not like efficiently. Um, so I guess the, I guess probably not um, unless it's one of the manifolds I already mentioned because we just don't know what, what the classification is for like three and higher. Um, does that? Does that kind of make sense? I'm not sure if I'm- Yeah, that, that's helpful. You're saying in particular, if it's via a Kirby diagram, maybe you can't answer the question for a particular G and K, but at least you can produce some trisection. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there are other, like, what are other ways that people do this? Yeah, that's what comes to mind immediately. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, there are so okay. So one example, one thing I can tell you is that um, Jeff, not not to not to keep embarrassing Jeff in front of everybody, um, but he he has this paper about um, spun lens spaces. So given a lens space, um, uh, he produce, he shows you how to get a diagram, a tri a genus three trisection diagram for the spin of that lens space, and that's like a very like algorithmic thing. So I guess there are probably like. Similarly, there, there, I think people have done like for certain classes of manifolds, people have figured things out like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but maybe, but yeah, probably the answer to your exact question is like, probably no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, any other um, questions? Well, I can I ask a silly question. Do I get CP2 bar by doing the Dane twist in the other direction so that the green curve runs the other way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, not silly at all. Um, cool. Any other questions? Cool. Um, okay. So, so now what I'm going to do is at, uh, attempt to prove to you um, that this that CB2 does admit this um, trisection. And um, I'm, I'm not actually gonna prove this to you in grueling detail because um, nobody would want to see that, but you'll see where I'll give you all of the tools um, you need to go home and write out the details yourself. Um, oh, hold on, there is a chat, Jeff. There we go. Uh, yeah, there's another example. So trisections are well-behaved with respect to branch coverings. So this tends to be a useful construction to consider. Thanks. Um, Okay, so uh, the statement is CP2 admits a one zero trisection, um, zero because the four dimensional pieces are going to be four balls, which we will see. Um, okay, so the way to see this is uh, first we write CP2 using these projected coordinates, Z1, Z2, Z3. Um, and then we have this map called the moment map, which um, I think comes from physics. Um, probably lots of people here know more than I what the history of this map is, um, but it's a useful map for producing this trisection. So that's that's why I like it. Um, so it's a map from CP2 to R2, and it's it's the following. So you send these coordinates to to these two coordinates here, um, and now I'm going to tell you a bunch of things about what the image of this map looks like and what pre-images of certain points look like. And this is the stuff I'm not going to prove to you, but I've given you the map and you can um, explore that yourself. I'll leave that as an exercise to the audience to um, verify these claims. So the first claim is that the image of this map um, is this, this triangle in the X, Y plane here, um, well, the, the filled in triangle. Um, and then, here, here are what a bunch of different pre-images look like. Um, so the pre-images of these corner points here, the triangle, um, just look like points. Um, the pre-image of a point inside the edge, so what I mean is like a point on the edge that's not a corner point, um, that's gonna be a circle. And then if you take together the pre-image of this entire edge, like what's happening is you have points on the end here, um, and then you have circles like above each middle point, and so what you get is a CP1 or a, a sphere, a two sphere um, like this um, above each edge. 
And then the pre-image of an interior point um, is going to be a torus. And I think like the fact that CP2 has this, um, you can kind of decompose it into tori like this means that it has this like toric geometry, is what people say. Um, and the way to get a trisection from this is to literally trisect this triangle. And then it just lifts to a trisection um, of CP2. Uh, so here's my point in the middle, one, one. And then I draw these lines here. And let's see what um, the pre-image of all these various pieces are. So this, this point here is just a point in the middle. So the pre-image of this is a torus. And this is going to be my, this specific torus will be my central torus in my trisection. Um, the pre-image of this like pink edge here, or this line going from the point out to the edge um, is a solid torus. And what's happening is like here I have my, what you're supposed to imagine is you have like your central torus and then I'm getting like concentric tori. You could imagine kind of getting like smaller and smaller in um, width, I guess, if, for lack of a better word, um, until we get all the way out into the center and it collapses to just a circle. And then all of those together give you a solid torus. Um, and then the pre-image of this like shaded part here is D2 cross D2. And so you, you really have like some corners here that you need to smooth, but you can smooth it and get a four ball. And so um, all together, um, here are the pieces of my trisection. So my central surface is a torus, so G equals one. Um, my handle bodies are solid tori. Um, and then my four dimensional pieces are four balls. And so um, this K, uh, my value of K is zero. All right, so that's where, oh, and a page chat. Can I move the points in the center? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, let's see what happens if you move it around. Uh, I mean, I think you're kind of just like isotoping. I, I mean, there is like one question about, there, there's like a general question of like, no, sorry, I don't want to get into that. I think, I think the answer is, I think short answer is yes. Um, and and you, you'll just get some equivalent trisection. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, what I was going to get into is I wonder like like how much could you mess this up and get a different trisection, but I think you can't. I mean, I, there's only there should be only just this one genus one trisection of CP2. So you you shouldn't be able to mess it up so much that you get a trisection that's not equivalent. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Yeah. And can you do this sort of thing with other toric four manifolds? I'm guessing no. Um, so I actually don't know. Like I'm kind of only familiar with just CP2 um, because of this. But like, um, I mean, yeah, I guess the answer should be no. Be again, because of this um, genus one fact. Um, but I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't exactly know. I don't know why, because I, I'm not super familiar with it. I think if you do the naive thing, you get like a D full section where D is the number of divisors at infinity. Maybe that will make sense to Nate. I see. You just, and, there and, is... they're, and they're all balls. That's I the see. thing. You get a bunch of balls glued together. Um, so there is like a notion of a multi-section. Um, this is due to Gabe um, is on Dooley. Or was it just Gabe or is it somebody else? It might be Gabe and Patrick Naylor. I don't know. Um, there is an idea of this of a multi-section, which is like a generalization. And so maybe it could be that maybe you can get like an obvious multi-section um, mm -hmm. by doing that. But maybe not the tri section. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Any other questions? All right. Sorry, my mom is texting me. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens when you look at your phone to keep track of them. Okay, next. All right, so back to the grids. So you might have noticed that when I first defined these grids in the beginning, I used the same color as the color of these curves on this trisection diagram, and that is not a coincidence. So here's my trisection diagram. Um, how I'm getting these grids is the following. I have here, I just have one curve of each color. I take a bunch of parallel copies um, over on the left. This is my attempt at drawing that. And it doesn't really look like a grid because I didn't draw it super well. But if I drew it spaced out better, you could imagine it would actually look exactly like this grid if I unwrap the torus into the square. Um, and so when I say that these triple knot 
grid diagrams live on a torus. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of them as living on this central torus um, in CP2, of this trisection of CP2. And why is it a triple grid, not diagram? Um, well, that's because it encodes three grids at once. Um, so pairwise, uh, you have three grids. So I have this red, this pink, blue grid, kind of obvious grid. Um, and then I have these two slanty grids where here I, I, I got these slanty grids by kind of cutting and pasting open. Um, like if you cut this, this square into two triangles and then move your triangles around, you can get these um, slanty pink, green, and then green, blue grids. Um, it's, it's easier to look at them like this um, rather than in this form, um, which you will see why in like one second. Um, and so we have dots in them. And, um, and so now I have dots in each of my three grids. And so that means I have three knot diagrams, or sorry, three knot, sorry, three grid diagrams for a knot, um, which is why it's, it's good to, it, it's useful to actually look at these like um, as if they were a square. Um, and so what, what is a knot diagram? Uh, so, so here are my three, this is the same example as the last slide, I just drew it so it's not as slanty. Um, so what I do is I have dots in my grid and I just connect the dots and I get a knot. Um, and when you do this, you have to pick um, like an, there's, there's an over under convention that you need to pick. Um, and basically the way that this, the, the setup of this construction coming from this trisection, there's kind of like a correct choice to make and the choice, which I don't really want to get into, but the choice is the following. So in the blue red diagram, um, I do blue over red. That means that if I have a strand parallel to the blue edges, that's going to go over a strand parallel to the red edges. And then similarly here, green over blue, and then here, red over green, which I guess here's the only example I have of a crossing in this picture right here, but that's okay. Um, so the way I've drawn these, it's, it's always that horizontal will go over um, vertical. And um, what we can do once we have that um, is if all of my, and I should say you could get a link too. So I, I've been saying that, but you could in each grid have multiple components and get a link. Um, and if all of your links in each grid are unlinked, um, you could cap them off with disks and you could get an embedded surface in CP2. Um, and so that's pretty cool. Um, and if you are familiar with trisections, you might say, hey, wait a second, this looks familiar. Um, so really this, this, what I'm doing is this is a particular shadow diagram for the bridge trisected surface. So, so Meyer and Zupan showed that um, if you have a surface embedded in a four manifold, um, that surface inherits a trisection from the trisection of your four manifold. That's called a bridge trisection. And really what I'm doing is I'm, um, you, you, can, you can describe these bridge trisected surfaces with shadow diagrams. And really what I'm doing is I'm taking a shadow diagram, but making it look like a grid. <laughs> I'm making it pointy. Um, and so this is kind of like, um, kind of like a very a specific case of something that's been done before. So it'd be cool if we could amp it up a little bit, which is uh, what I will do. Um, but before that, um, just one one more definition um, is a triple knot grid diagram is orientable if X's and O's can be placed consistently. Um, what I mean by that is um, I have this example up here um, in every row, column, and diagonal. You, so you, you replace your, all of your vertices with X's and O's, and you want um, in every row, column, and diagonal, you want there to be exactly one X and exactly one O. And um, if you, you either can or you can't do this, and if you can, it's orientable. If you can't, it's not. Um, and if you have an orientable diagram, you get an orientable surface, because what happens is you're, you're orienting, if, if you can do this, um, you're, you're orienting your knots compatibly, and then that orients the disks compatibly and then that that gives you an orientation on the whole surface. Um, uh, so yeah. Um, but let's let's um, take it up to the next level. Um, so I guess you know so far you might be like, why is this talk um, being given in this seminar? <laughs> and so now time for a geometry uh, interlude. And um, these slides, to be honest, uh, are being reused <laughs> From, from a talk that was not given in a seminar that was specifically for symplectic geometers. Um, so this, these, these slides are maybe a little, a little moot for this seminar, but I think instead of just not talking about them, I think I'll still talk about them, but maybe go a little fast if that's okay. Um, um, but I don't wanna totally skip them because then I don't know, they might, might be missing some context or something. Um, okay, 
Uh, so this is my, you know, for people who don't know about contact or simplicate geometry, this is kind of like my lay of the land for those people. So uh, um, I'm not specifically defining anything here um, super rigorously, but um, probably for this audience, that's okay. Anyway, so for three dimensional, sorry, for odd dimensional manifolds, um, uh, we have this geometry we can do called contact um, geometry. Um, so a contact manifold is an odd dimensional manifold um, equipped with C, this maximally non integrable hyperplane field. Um, and there's a special subclass of manifolds called Legendrian submanifolds. Um, this is if, if your odd dimension is 2n plus 1, these have dimension n. Um, and for these manifolds, um, the, the tangents um, space of these manifolds is totally, sorry, the, the tangencies of these manifolds are included in your C in your hyperplane field. Um, and then there's kind of a, there is a mirrored story with even dimensional manifolds. So uh, for even dimensions, we can have symplectic manifolds, which is a um, even dimensional manifold equipped with an omega, which is a closed non-degenerate two form. And the special subclass um, that, that I care about for this talk is called Lagrangian submanifold, which is unfortunately extremely close to Legendrian, which has been a nightmare, but that's okay. Uh, these are um, these have dimension half of um, the dimension of your total space, and these are manifolds where the symplectic form restricted to them is zero. And so, in my case um, specifically, here are the dimensions we're thinking about. So, my contact manifold is three dimensional. My Legendrian submanifold is one dimensional. That means that they're not. Um, my symplectic manifold is four dimensional, which makes sense because it's going to be CP two, <laughs> which is four dimensional. And my Legendrian submanifolds are surfaces. Um, so you can kind of see where this is going. My my knots that I showed you in the previous slide are going to be are going to be Legendrian knots, and uh, the surface is going to be a Lagrangian surface. That's the goal. Um, and, and here's kind of a little bit a little bit more background building up. Um, so so here's the picture of the standard contact um, structure on R three, which I think I will I will. Um, not talk about too much, um, but the reason I have this here is because I want to remind people that there's no um, vertical tangencies. These planes are never totally vertical. And so that means that when we take the front projection of our knot, um, this is the projection onto the XC plane, um, we get these pointy diagrams um, that are called Legendrian fronts. Um, and that's because our knot, we can never kind of go vertically like this and have a vertical tendency. We kind of have to like swing around and from the side that looks like having cusps. Um, so this is just a reminder, um, because these are the specific diagrams of Lachandrians that I'm going to be thinking about. Um, and then on the symplectic side of things, um, I'm thinking about Lagrangian cabordisms. Well, I will say, um, I don't actually think about Lagrangian cabordisms too much, but this is, this is kind of like the background of where I learned this stuff from, I guess. So this is like, this is like um, where my perspective comes from. Um, so given two Lachandrian knots, um, you can have a Lagrangian cabordism between these Legendrian knots. Um, and here the order matters, which I think is like really weird. Um, so, so just for smooth cabordisms, you have this like symmetry property where you can just turn it upside down and get, uh, and it doesn't really matter what's on top and what's on bottom. Um, but in the symplectic worlds, you can't necessarily. And I think that's super weird. Um, but really what I care about um, is, is this case here where we have a cap. So, so if your bottom knot is the empty knot, you, you call it a filling. If your top knot is the empty knot, you call it a cap. And, and caps are um, specifically the ones that I care about here. And actually, um, uh, here, I'm glad I'm speaking to this audience because now I can kind of outsource a question that I've had. So, so um, one fact that, um, that is going to be very important in a second is that um, in order to admit a cap, um, in order for a Legendrian unknot to admit a cap, it has to have thurston Benekin number um, minus one. And where I know this from is a paper of Chantrain um, that, that gives a few equations um, relating, saying if you have a Lagrangian cabordism between your two Legendrian knots, um, it gives equations that relate the rotation number, the TB and genus of your cabordism. Um, and so that's where I know this fact from. But th that might actually be like a hammer or like a, what's it called, like a, a mallet or something and my fact is a fly like i'm not actually sure if this is a, a a more simple fact that that comes from something that's less um 
uh, complicated than than actually looking at this like a uh, Lagrangian cobordism in general. So I don't know if if anybody knows um, more simply where that fact comes from, that would be a very useful thing for me to know. I've asked around a little bit, haven't haven't really got uh, figured that out. So anyway, I know this fact from this paper of Chantrey. Um, but okay, so so to to um, to sum up all, what all of this rambling was about. What I'm going to care about is um, Legendrian caps, and um, a condition um, to have a Legendrian cap is to have TV minus one. So that will be important um, in the next slide. Um, okay, so I'm going to take all my pieces and throw this geometry at it. So um, uh, what it, knot diagrams are very commonly used to represent Legendrian knots, and the way you do it is you turn um, either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on context. For me, it will be clockwise, again, coming from just the, the structure of, of CP2 and the trisection where this is all coming from. Um, so I turn 45 degrees clockwise, uh, and then I, I smooth out my top and bottom corners, and then I make my left and right corners cusp, and that's a legendre in front. Um, and then here's kind of the goal. <laughs> so I'm going to make surfaces. And the, the hope is to build a Lagrangian surface. Um, and so now I'm thinking of my links as Legendrian. I want to impose the extra condition um, that they're TV minus one on links because otherwise I don't have a, a hope of, um, oops, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I knew cap sounded weird. I'm sorry, I meant Phil. <laughs> I said cap this whole time on this previous slide. What I meant was Phil. And if you were confused about why I was saying cap in that fact, because that's not true, <laughs> I meant Phil. Um, sorry, we want to fill with Lagrangian disks. Um, okay, and the hope is that this gives us a Lagrangian surface. Um, what I've what I've done is I've kind of called these Lagrangian-like. So just to be clear, what I mean by a Lagrangian-like surface is it's a surface that you get um, from a diagram where all of your links are Legendrian TB minus one unlinks. Um, and so the next question is like, okay, does Lagrangian-like actually mean Lagrangian? Um, so are Lagrangian-like surfaces um, smoothly isotopic to Lagrangians? And um, I think the answer is yes. Um, uh, I wrote it as theorem with a big asterisk. <laughs> and the reason there's an asterisk is because I think this isn't like, like immediately clear. There are some details I'm still working out. Um, I was hoping to have the details worked out <laughs> by the time for this talk, but um, some job stuff got in the way. <laughs> and so um, instead of giving you a proof sketch. I'm going to give you kind of like an idea of where where the complicated where the complications come from. Oh, and sweet, there is a chat. Um, I think it's your reference for a simpler argument. Sweet. OK, I will look at that um, later, probably then. Um, but thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, would you would you mind repeating what Lagrangian like means? Yeah, sorry, I would I went through that very fast. Um, so Lagrangian like just means it's a maybe it's a smooth surface that you that you get by um, from a triple knot grid diagram mm -hmm. where all of your links are TB minus one unlinks. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and so it's basically I'm like hedging on what saying that the surface you get is Lagrangian. Um, and then I want to show that this the surface that I got. Um, well, you can smoothly, oops, sorry, isotope it to an actual Lagrangian in CP2. Um, and uh, basically, the reason why it's complicated is corners. And, and so when, when I was doing the trisection of CP2 earlier, um, what I said is you really get like a D2 cross a D2 um, for your four dimensional pieces, which has a corner. But it turns out you can just like smooth that out and then you get a trisection and, it's, and your pieces are smooth and that's fine. Um, but when you're working with these geometries, you can't just say like, ah, smooth it and it's fine. Like you have to actually be careful and make sure that when you smooth it, you're still like carrying along this geometry that you want it to have. Um, and so like the idea, um, like the natural thing that you would want to do is kind of just build up your Lagrangian surface from the center. So, so here's my center, my central torus um, in my trisection. And um, the, the points are where are these points, sorry. The, the surface will intersect my central surface at these points, which are the dots in the grid diagram. And so you can kind of no problem make little Lagrangian neighborhoods of those points. Um, and then this is supposed to be one of my handle bodies. Um, and, and the obvious thing to do, um, 
so so each of my edges, my colored edges, um, uh, so like my vertical edges are in one handle body, my horizontal edges are in another handle body, and my my diagonal edges are in a third handle body. And kind of the obvious thing to do is to connect my points um, in in edges like this. And that's what I've literally done when I'm drawing these like grid diagrams. Um, and you can make kind of like um, transverse Lagrangian neighborhoods like that. But the problem is now I I kind of like am making something that has corners in it. And so it's like really my Legendrian knots um, actually look like squares <laughs> with like a little like a corner on top and bottom rather than like these smooth Legendrians. Um, and so then it's like a little unclear if I actually want to like fill with a Lagrangian. Um, it's like a little unclear how to how to do this in a way that like is going to actually produce something smooth, um, which is kind of the goal. Um, so so there's like some technical details to be worked out. And I think I think kind of like what what um, what I'm trying to do is in each little disk here where I have an edge is just edit my contact structure a little bit in a way that that's not actually changing anything, but lets me kind of smooth just in that little neighborhood. Um, and then do that everywhere, and then things will probably be fine. So I'm kind of still working through the details on that. Um, so yeah, that's where things are at. But um, hopefully we'll work through those details soon and then put that right in my thesis and be good to go. Um, so then there are kind of, I think, some natural questions. These are kind of like what I want to conquer next um, after working out these details. So one question is, um, do triple knot grid diagrams uniquely determine Lagrangians? So, like, if I get this construction to work, um, you know, I can get it smoothly isotopic to some Lagrangian, but is that going to be unique? Um, is unique up to what Hamiltonian isotopy, Lagrangian isotopy, etc.? Um, and then, kind of like the reverse thing. So, is every Lagrangian in CP two um, isotopic to one given by a triple grid diagram? So, do I get some kind of like one to one correspondence there? Um, so, th those are questions I would like to answer next. Um, and then here's a slide that is um, <laughs> kind of kind of like annoying to to present, but this is a slide that's kind of trying to convince you that um, as I've been working with these diagrams, I I kind of have evidence um, that these things really do behave like Lagrangians. So so like evidence that I'm on the right track and trying to prove something that is true. Um, and so these two I've called them propositions are. Um, kind of telling me what possible surfaces I can get for really small diagrams. So the first one says that if all of the faces of a triple knot grid diagram are squares, or that is, they, they look like this, um, then the surface is RP2. And in particular, the diagram must have exactly one face in every grid. Um, and then my second one is if all of the faces of a triple knot grid diagram are squares or hexagons, which I'm just calling, uh, it means that my, my face is a link where my component, each component of the link has either four or six vertices. Um, then the surface has Euler characteristic zero, one, or two. Um, and this is promising because the only orientable embedded Lagrangians in CP2 are tori. Um, and so this, this is at least in these small examples, ruling out higher genus surfaces. Unfortunately, it's not ruling out the sphere, um, but um, it's a, it looks like a step in the right direction. These things are like behaving like, um, like I would expect it to. Um, and, and I have kind of many examples that, that kind of show this. I'm, I'm gonna show you uh, some examples and that, that's how I will conclude. Um, so here's kind of like a preliminary classification for like small diagrams. These are only for what I've called full triple knot grid diagrams. So um, no empty rows, columns, or diagonals. Um, so for two by two, I have a unique diagram, which is a Lagrangian like RP2. Um, for three by three, I have a unique diagram, which is a Lagrangian like torus. Um, for four by four, I have three diagrams, which are all RP2s, and two are Lagrangian like. And sorry, just to clarify, when I say Lagrangian like, what I mean is they satisfy this extra TB minus one condition. No, no, that's what I mean. Um, and then five by five, I have six diagrams. Four are two whole torus, um, two are four copies of RP2, and none of them are Lagrangian like, which is good. Um, because if I got something where like the Euler characteristic was a, a two-hole torus um, and my components were TB minus one, well, that would break everything. <laughs> Can I ask? Um, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. In this uh, third case where you have two Lagrangian uh, RP2, two Lagrangian-like RP2s, um, is one of them or both of them clearly the stabilization or a stabilization of the two by two? 
Um, that is a good question. I don't remember. I don't remember what the diagrams look like. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I think it's somehow. Um, it be, I think we only know one Lagrangian RP two inside CP two. So if you could produce another one, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. That's that's that is very good to know. Um, and probably immediately after this talk, I'll go look at that diagram and think about that. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so for two for two by two and three by three, um, th these are the, the two diagrams. Um, and I do think um, I my, <laughs> what what you're saying seems to match up with something my advisor says that I don't know if I can exactly remember. But but he says he he's he says this diagram is what he expects to be like the real like the art the Lagrangian RP two and 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 CP two. Um, so this. This I think is is probably what you're talking about, and then I guess the question is, are my other diagrams really just like you know this? Um, uh, so yeah, so here's here's my RB two. That all the knots look like actual little squares. There's little little Legendrian eyes, and then here's my T two. Um, well, here's what all the knots look like, um, and then here's another example for a Lagrangian like torus, where like the diagram is definitely different because. Um, here in one of my faces, I have two components, so that's kind of interesting. But then, yeah, like uh, you know, the question will be like, if these really are Lagrangians, like is this a different Lagrangian torus than the three by three, or is it not? You know, um, I don't know. Um, what did stabilization in that last? Exchange? Sorry, I meant what did stabilization mean in that last exchange? Um, I will defer to Mohammed. Oh, like, yeah, like unclear. Like, what would, yeah. So, I, I, and I actually don't know, like, what would it mean to stabilize a diagram? Because, again, like the obvious thing, like putting in just like an empty row and column, like that, you can't just do that anywhere you want um, because you're going to mess up your diagonals. So, I, I don't have like a good notion of what it means to stabilize these diagrams. Um, I, but I, I assume there's some, uh, oh, okay, there we go. Preservation of the bridge type. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, um, given a bridge trisection, we there's there is a notion of stabilization for bridge trisections, and I'm not, I am not sure how to see that using these diagrams. Um, yeah, so, like this diagram showing here, you can you can see that it will be like bridge perturbed. So torus here is is smoothly isotopic to the one, but it's not so obvious how you can realize that the perturbation to um through grid diagrams, although it's possible though, that like you, this diagram, you should be able to cancel like one of the X's and O's in the uh, like pair diagonally in the top right, and then reduce to full, uh, what was it? Three by three of the torus. I see. And this is, yeah. is this, this is like a very similar thing to like what you and Peter are doing in your like com complex, your like rational surfaces paper. Yeah, it's pretty similar. Yeah, I could show you how this deep perturbs smoothly. Yeah, sure. I'll ask, I'll ask you about it in the fall. <laughs> Perfect. Um, cool. Okay. Um, so then um, next is here's just like an maybe interesting class of examples. Um, when, when I gave this talk in the grad student seminar here and, and somebody asked me, Do, are, are there always diagrams for every N? And the answer is yes, here they are. Um, so I call these like staircases because uh, one of the knots looks like a staircase. And when n is even, you always get a Lagrangian like RP2. Um, that's because um, uh, you can, so the Euler characteristic, you can calculate it as um, the number of knot components um, minus the grid number. So here the grid number is increasing, but also the number of components is increasing. And so those cancel each other out. And the the Euler characteristic stays, um, I forget, whatever it needs to be, I guess one um, to be an RP2. Um, over here, when you have n odd, you have an orientable diagram and it's a connect sum of n minus one over two tori and it's only Lagrangian-like for n equals three. So when n equals three, it's the same diagram I showed you previously, but for larger n's, um, this is like what one of your knots looks like and this this is not gonna have um, uh, TB minus one. So there we go. Um, and then last but not least, um, there's kind of like lots of directions that um, 
you could go in with this project that you know I'm hoping hoping to continue going in in the future. So like one thing you could do is just like forget about uh, the surface and just say what you know can you use these diagrams to study knots or what can you say about knots? And kind of the first like obvious um, invariant of knots you could get is a minimal triple grid number, um, kind of mirroring just the grid number of, of, of knots. And you could define this in like different ways. So you, so you could start, you could define it for a smooth link. So the minimal triple grid number of a smooth link would be the smallest um, n such that uh, you can find a triple grid diagram, uh, an n by n triple grid diagram that has L as just one of its links. Um, and then you can do the same for Legendrian. Um, and then you could even do the same for a triple of knots. So you could say um, a, the minimal triple grid number of a triple of Legendrian links is the smallest n such that you have a triple, an n by n triple knot grid diagram that has that triple as its three links. And like one question is, is that always defined? Like, I don't know. Like if I just pick any three Legendrian links, can I always put them in a grid? Um, that I don't know. Um, uh, but here, here's just a few known results coming from like the examples that I, you know, worked out previously. Um, so these are a bunch of minimal triple grid numbers for various small knots. And um, they're all not interesting in the sense that they're all the same as the regular grid number, um, except the half link is, is the only one where it's different. Um, so a half link has regular grid number four. You can put it in a four by four grid. Um, but for a triple knot grid diagram, you can't put it in a grid until you have grid number six. Um, and, and here's an example of that, um, of a six by six grid with a hop link in it. Um, and this is also kind of like an interesting example, um, because if I do the whole construction, like, like, so, so far I've only thought about embedded surfaces, but one thing, one, you know, another future direction I could go in is to think about immersed surfaces. Um, and so here I have a hop link as one of my links and then just two um, unlinked. And so if I cap that hop link off, I'll get like a, um, I'll get a, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Singularity. Um, and, and this ends up being a Lagrangian like S2 with a double point. Um, and so that, that's another cool thing I haven't thought too much about, but another direction that I would um, hope to go in. Um, and I think that is all I have. Um, thanks so much again for um, the invitation. It's been fun. <laughs> okay, let's thank Sarah for the great talk. Any more questions? Um, I actually got lost in the construction of the surface, I think. So I have three disks by capping off the three links. Um, yeah. What do I do with them? So it's like, so you, 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 they're glued together like by the knots. Um, so, oh, I have, I kind of have a schematic of it, but it's not, it's not included in this, unfortunately, but okay. So like I have my torus and where the surf, the surface intersects the torus in a bunch of points. Um, and then this torus in the trisection, this torus bounds three um, solid tori, like you could kind of one here, one here and one here. And each of these arcs, so I kind of, I have three sets of arcs that happen in the three handle bodies. So I have arcs here, here, and here. Um, and, and then um, pairwise, these arcs make links. And then I, I cap them off. So I have like a, like a, a disc here, discs here, and discs here. And then they glue together and they get the surface. Sorry, okay. that's a lot of... <laughs> And there's, oh, there's wow. nothing in the center. You're not like gluing all of them to something. You're gluing them to each other. Yes. OK. Cool. Thanks. Um, there's a, a great picture. If you want like a good schematic, um, if, you look, if you look in Jeff and Alex's um, um, bridge trisections of surfaces in S4, there's like a good um, schematic of what's going on. That's like, th this is what I kind of have mentally when I'm like moving my hands around like this. I uh -huh. wish I had a, a picture instead of moving my hands. So if you look there, there's a good picture there. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question um, about the, the theorem star. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm not sure if I understand the right kind of take home message of that. Um, like I was wondering if the right way to think about that is that this is sort of 
information toward understanding all the Lagrangians in CP2, or if there's another way of how I should think about this? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the hope. I mean, I think like um, maybe like one takeaway is like, is like that maybe this theorem is like immediately. So I guess there's kind of two, two things. Like one is like, is this result immediately obvious? And I, I don't think it is. And I was kind of trying to say like, we have these corners. And so that makes this like not immediately obvious um, uh, like that I'm actually building a Lagrangian. But yeah, like it, if this theorem is true I think the takeaway is kind of exactly what you said like it would be really great, you know geometry is hard and it would be really great um, if I could have this like machinery for describing Lagrangian surfaces in CP2 using these diagrams. And then even better, like if I could answer these questions, I would have this kind of like dictionary, this like one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and then, you know, can I use that? That would be kind of like a launching point for a whole other route of investigation. Can I use that to prove things about Lagrangians in CP2? And I don't, I don't have like specific questions in that direction yet, but um, that, that's kind of like the overall goal of the project. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Sarah? I have a question on that slide that's right there. Um, so um, when you say like need to smooth the corners, um, are you trying to get very close? Are you trying to find, for example, a Legendrian knot with TB minus one that is very close to this smooth knot? Or does it just have to be, um, you know, just a smoothing, but not necessarily close. Because um, there are some guess, TB obstructions to being close to a smooth knot. So. Yeah, um, I think close. I think this is part of maybe this second, this first question here. Like I think, um, like I think knowing the answer to your question will will maybe partially answer this this first question here. I guess I'm not totally sure. Is it known that a given um, Legendrian a knot bounds a, a unique Lagrangian disk? I think is that a yes? Yeah? Is that yes? Yeah? I can't tell. So Mohammed shaking his head. I, I think can't you have to impose at least have to impose exactness. Okay. okay. I think that it may be so. But I'm slightly. I think in the ball. I'm in the ball. It's true. Um, so therefore, it's going to help you in CP two. Mm -hmm. But um, but I'm, I'm of course okay. My next. I was going to ask actually since since I'm talking anyway. You know. I mean, I'm going to ask Sarah. I'm going to ask you the question that you said you were going to try to avoid having asked by answering it before it gets asked. <laughs> Um, this step, which you say that you, you know, haven't finished, yeah, it really doesn't look specific to CP2. Yeah. You're saying what you have is, what you're trying to prove is you can construct something and you need to make sure that you can smooth it correctly while remaining Lagrangian. Yeah. So I assume that all the difficulties are local to where the three things come together at this one point. So yeah. I don't, I don't even understand, like it doesn't even look like you need for it to have been the unknot on the outside yeah. because, because I assume everything is local. Yeah, well, so one, okay. So one, one thing to say is that like, if your goal is to get a grid, like a nice grid diagram, that, that's where I'm using like the fact that we're on a course. So I guess it's like if you want if you want to do this for higher genus like trisection services, probably you're right. Like you could get this to work out, but I guess like the problem is like what do these diagrams look like? So like kind of the goal for me is to have nice diagrams. And so like um, I don't know if it's like worth doing it otherwise, if you don't, but like maybe it is worth doing it, but um, but uh, it's at least a lot harder to like to to like think about what grid diagrams look like when they're on like a higher higher genus surface. Um, um, yeah, when was I going to say something else? 
I can't remember. Was there something else to what you said? <laughs> I think I maybe have some other questions, but maybe for discussion, not for, for, not for, the, okay. for the question. Okay, any more, any more questions? I, um, I have a quick question. This method is probably ties into the discussion currently. So if it does, you can postpone it to the discussion. Um, but is this ge generalized? I mean, it looks like it's a way to find Lagrangians in CP2. Would this work for other, say, four-dimensional torque manifolds? Yeah, I guess. Well, probably. OK, so maybe like a quick answer is like, yes, in the sense that um, Jeff, Jeff and Alex have this kind of this whole theory for how to bridge trisect surfaces. So maybe there's like a quick answer, yes, but like the, the complicated Oh, well, okay, right. But but keeping the Lagrangian thing, I guess that I don't know. Um, and it could be that like, yes, this this easily generalizes, this construction easily generalizes, but then again, you don't get di like nice diagrams. But maybe you don't care about the nice diagrams. Um, but yeah, I guess the question, I guess like a very short answer is, I don't know. I've only really thought about this, this setting so far, but um, that would be like a, a good, like an obvious and probably like a good avenue to explore um, once I nail down how things work here. Thanks. Okay, any more questions? All right, let's give Sarah another hand. <laughs> 